everyone. Thanks for joining me again. Today it's going to be more of a journal with me session instead of a plan with me session, but it's going to be a double daily spread in my Hobonichi. And it's actually going to be using the pages to do a little book reading journal about two of my favorite books I've read so far this year. I read them both in January, actually, but now that the quarter's coming to an end, it's time to go ahead and journal about those. They're very different books, and as you can kind of see, I started out with some larger copies of the covers and decided to go with the smaller copies to give myself a little bit more of an opportunity to do a little bit of decorating and more writing. The books are Ninth House by Leah Bardugo, and Bittersweet by Susan Kane, And you could not possibly ask for two more different books than these two. Ninth House is, I would say, urban fantasy, modern day setting. It won the Goodreads 2019, I believe it was, uh, Best Fantasy Award. But I haven't had a whole lot of luck with the winners of some of those categories on Goodreads. So I'm just now, in 2023, getting around to reading this. Some of the decorative elements that I'm using here, I'm using a couple of different types of washi tape that I feel like suited the mood of the book itself. The one that I tucked back behind the cover was one that reminded me a lot of the circles they were drawing on the ground for protection in the book. And then that seal just kind of brought in a little pop of color. It has a crown in the middle of it, makes it look like a wax seal. These stamps are from a company called Everyday Explorers, and they make fantastic stamps for memory keeping and for journaling. I have quite the collection, but I haven't used them in my planners in the last couple of years because of the fact that this Tomoe River paper doesn't take stamping very well. However, I think I found a workaround. I've started using the Tombow markers to color these stamps because the paper is very receptive to those markers. Here I'm using a dark, cool gray to color this stamp a little bit that says the date started and the date uh, finished. I use a strip of washi tape at the bottom to tie in the color of the seal at the top, some of the dark color of the book cover itself, and the ink that I'm going to use. This is a fountain pen called um, Shape of a Heart. It's a platinum fountain pen, and it's filled with a, an ink that is a really dark, dark maroon, kind of a red. It's hard, hard to distinguish coming out of this extra fine nib that it is anything other than black, but it's actually a red, and it's a diamine ink called Rider's Blood, which seemed appropriate. I started Ninth House with pretty low expectations, and it took me a little while to get into the rhythm of the writing and to start sympathizing with the character. Uh, the female character um, is attending Yale, on a, quote, scholarship due to the fact that she can see and speak with ghosts. The magic system, uh, it was so unique. The setting, which is the university campus in New Haven, uh, the Yale campus, was unto itself a character. And did anyone else have a connection where they saw the main character of Galaxy Stern shortened to Alex. How great is that? I started picturing her as Jenna Ortega from Wednesday because I think I watched Wednesday right before I started this book and I could not get that impression out of my head. Once Jenna Ortega was established as Alex Stern in my head, it was a done deal. So just for future casting of the movie, Jenna Ortega, that's, that would be my main character selection. I found her incredibly sympathetic, despite the fact that she had this very hard and cold exterior. You find out pretty quickly 
she that's a protective mode to keep from getting hurt. She is more sympathetic the longer you read the book. You start to understand why she is the way she is. She is wounded and she is brittle, particularly at the beginning. But she gets stronger as the novel progresses and she becomes more confident. It had a an excellent ending, which I will not spoil for you here. The plot was excellent. I started to see a little bit of it early, but so satisfactory a conclusion that it was just like mm, chef's kiss on this book for that. Her job is to basically police these eight secret societies on the Yale campus, centering the magic system around those secret societies was something I've never read before. Completely unique in that urban fantasy setting and gave it a certain realistic flavor that I enjoy in my fantasy. I did feel like maybe I could go to the Yale campus and wander around and see some of the actual landmarks that she talks about, that they might actually exist in real life. And that was incredibly well done. There's even a map at the beginning of the book, which in my personal opinion, all great fantasy includes a map at the beginning of the book. But there's a map of the Yale campus. I'd like to read a couple of quotes from the book that I thought were particularly well done. The first one comes early in the book as Alex is being shown around campus and being mentored by a senior by the name of Darlington. He is trying to instruct her and show her what needs to be done to basically protect the outside world from the rituals and magical castings that are being done by these secret societies, these eight houses on the Yale campus. The quote is actually from Darlington's perspective as he's showing Alex the ropes. It starts mid-sentence. This was the moment he'd been waiting for. The chance to show someone else wonder. To watch them realize that they had not been lied to. That the world they'd been promised as children was not something that had to be abandoned. That there really was something lurking in the wood. Beneath the stairs. Between the stars. That everything was full of mystery. When Alex arrives on the Yale campus, it's pretty obvious that she has been through the ringer. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, <laughs> mentally, she has been through it. The girl has been living a hard, hard life. And there's a certain amount of death and destruction and chaos that she has left in her wake. And it's pretty obvious that she is still suffering because of that. But there is a quote that I felt like was the point where, one of the points where I started to be extremely sympathetic to her plight. Um, it's a very short quote, and it is um, as she's thinking about the people and her current situation and the people that came before and who were friends of hers before who are no longer with her. And she says, as internal monologue, I let you die. To save myself, I let you die. That is the danger in keeping company with survivors. I think it was that, that point that I was like, oh my God, you could definitely benefit from a good therapist because that is some serious survivor's guilt going on there. When I finished Ninth House, I rated it 7.5 out of 10. That's the rating scale that I use. I'm very much looking forward to reading the sequel, which is called Hellbent, that just came out uh, a couple months ago, I believe. And I'm glad I didn't read Ninth House any sooner. That way I can just roll right into the sequel with the story firmly in my head still. I don't need to do any rereading and uh, remind myself of where that left off. And it did leave off on a little bit of a cliffhanger. I mean, it was pretty satisfactorily concluded, but 
it was definitely set up for a sequel to leave you wanting more. Now, as they say, for something completely different. I read Bittersweet by Susan Cain because, mainly for the fact that I had read her first nonfiction book, and this is nonfiction, uh, her first book was called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And I loved that book. I ran right out and bought a hard copy of it, and it went straight onto my favorite's bookshelf. It was her first book, and it was incredibly insightful, I felt like, in my opinion. So when it was decided that for a book club that I'm part of, we were going to read this book, and it has been quite the number of years between books for her, They are so well worth it, though. This one tackles uh, a really kind of strange subject. Uh, The fine print on the cover says, Bittersweet is the title, and it says, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. She kind of defines bittersweetness, and I'm just reading this straight from the flap on the inside cover. Bittersweetness is a tendency to states of longing, poignancy, and sorrow, an acute awareness of passing time, and a curiously piercing joy at the beauty of the world. It recognizes that light and dark, birth and death, bitter and sweet, are forever paired. I actually started reading this book by listening to it as an audiobook because I tend to prefer to listen to nonfiction rather than read it. And I made the mistake of starting it on my drive to work as I was commuting. And about 10 minutes in to the prelude, I wasn't even into the introduction yet. I hadn't even made it through the prelude. I was already crying so hard. I had to pull my car over and stop listening to the audiobook in order to be able to drive safely. Starting the book with the story of the cellist of Sarajevo messed me up. So on this page in my planner, I'm using a variety of decorative elements. Um, I'm using these Sakura vintage color gel pens that are fantastic. I'm using a set that includes kind of a blue-gray and then a second set that has kind of an ochre um, golden color that matches the washi tape that I use that has the butterflies and the like autumnal grasses because mainly to me, Autumn is the most bittersweet season as things are dying and yet are still so beautiful. I cut a couple of butterflies out of some more washi tape and then the flowers that are the circular ones down in the right corner, those are actually real pressed flowers. Butterflies seemed appropriate, too, in this spread because they are, in many cultures, a symbol of rebirth and metamorphosis and change from one thing into another. And pressed dried flowers are usually kept because they are memories of a time gone by that you want to capture the sweetness and the joy of. The stamp at the top is, of course, just the same stamp I used on the other page for Ninth House, only I used a blue Tombow marker to color it in this time. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that this book is a real downer, because it's not. It's actually a very hopeful book. It's very insightful, but it definitely has those moments where it demonstrates the subject matter on your person and the prelude would not be the last time that this book made me weep. The book itself is wonderfully written. It's incredibly well researched. It covers a lot of very interesting 
topics and has a lot of real life stories um, and analogies to back it up. There is a quiz in the introduction called the Bittersweet Quiz where you can actually find out where you rate on a scale yourself as far as this bittersweet component is concerned. And of course, I scored in the highest segment, unsurprisingly, um, where I'm, quote, a true connoisseur of the place where light and dark meet. Before the author even launches into chapter one, she finds herself wondering along the same lines as Aristotle did back 2,000 years ago, why it seems that a lot of artists, great poets, philosophers, seem to have more melancholic personalities and an appreciation for the melancholic or the bittersweet. I'd like to read a quote. Most of all, bittersweetness shows us how to respond to pain by acknowledging it and attempting to turn it into art the way the musicians do, or healing, or innovation, or anything else that nourishes the soul. If we don't transform our sorrows and longings, we can end up inflicting them on others via abuse, domination, neglect. But if we realize that all humans know or will know loss and suffering, we can turn towards each other. This idea of transforming pain into creativity, transcendence, and love is at the heart of the book. And that's where part one, chapter one starts with the how. How do we transform that pain into creativity? And she starts out with a very modern story of the Pixar director, Pete Docter, working on a film that would become Inside Out, which is one of my favorite Pixar movies. <laughs> and it's all about embracing the aspect of sorrow in one's life, as well as joy. Um, he couldn't get the film during development. He couldn't get it to work. At that time, though, he had fear instead of sorrow being the main foil to joy. And it wouldn't work. And it wasn't until he changed that character to sorrow, to sadness, that the film finally came together. As if you couldn't tell, this was going to be a favorite of mine. <laughs> I rated it a 10 out of 10. Okay, guys, that's it for me. I'm finished with the spread. I hope you enjoyed it. And I also hope that you have a fantastic week ahead. Bye!